Welcome to everyone um, from buyilw.com to our ILW seminar uh, today on AB5 Reform and Integrity Act. Uh, this is a professional B2B event. Um, this is not intended for immigrants, it's intended for attorneys, projects, um, and other professionals in this field, such as business plan writers and economists. Um, um, and uh, please keep that in mind. But nevertheless, we are all bound by US law. So I'm going to read our usual disclaimers that nothing you hear today is legal advice, nothing you hear today is financial advice, everything you hear today is educational and is designed to arm you with information. Information is power. And the idea is to give you such information as you need in order to perform your professional duties with diligence um, appropriately. Um, I I want to, uh, before I, uh, the sequence structure is very simple. I'm going to pose questions to our distinguished panelists in turn. So you'll get to hear each one of each of them equally. I'm once again requesting and reminding our panelists they have about two and a quarter minutes for each question to give a condensed uh, response. Um, and now before we start, we're going to take a quick 30 second commercial break. I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Shrikant. Please take it away. Uh, thank you, Sam. Uh, ILW has EBFI events coming up where you can market to potential EBFI investors both in the USA and in Asia. In the USA, we're doing events in Austin on April 22nd, Dallas on April 24th, and San Jose on May 7th. In addition, we have Asia events in Mumbai on May 19th and Kuwait on May 22nd. To exhibit and speak at these events, you can reach us at webmaster at ilw.com. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. End of commercial. Back to the program. I'm going to start... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, with uh, with Laura, um, you know, it took us five years to get to where we are. What did we ask for? Let's start with that. Can we just hear what did we ask for? Well, thank you so much, Sam. And I'm really happy to be here with my distinguished panelists. It's really great to see Angelo and David again, and you, Sam, and Srikant. So thank you for having us. Um, as you know, the, the industry has been working on a long-term solution to the EB-5 Regional Center sunset for more than five years. It's really going all the way back to 2014 when we started this series of short-term extensions. So um, we've always wanted to have a longer-term extension. We got that now. We've always wanted to have something that gives the EB-5 program um, uh, more visa numbers, frankly or some way to, to reduce the backlog. We didn't really get that, but we've got some workarounds and some ideas on how we could address that on a going forward basis. Um, we wanted fair uh, set-asides and fair um, processing for rural and now the um, infrastructure um, programs. We wanted fair investment levels, unlike what we saw in the 2019 regulations, which we thought were unfair and were struck down. Uh, we wanted a fair differential between the two investment levels. So we got the program reauthorized. That's the good thing. It lives to breathe a new day, and we still have some challenges ahead of us, but we're really pleased to see that at least some of the goals of industry have been met in this legislation, and we are very optimistic about some um, reaching some of the other goals going forward. Wonderful. Thank you, Laura, for that uh, succinct summary of uh, you know, how we got to where we are. Um, let's turn to where we are and let me turn to Angelo Paparelli. You know, there's all kinds of timing um, uh, provisions within the new statute. Some provisions go into effect right away. Some will go into effect um, prospectively. Um, uh, and some of them will have a backwards reach and will be retroactive in effect and some won't. Can you walk us through that, sir? Well, that's a complicated subject, Sam, and I'm happy to be here. And uh, I am also honored to uh, sit and present with uh, two very distinguished colleagues and friends. Uh, Laura and David. Uh, I would say that uh, uh, you can't have one size fits all uh, answer to that question because there are so many different uh, effective dates. And uh, there is also the question that typically applies with um, congressional statutes is what to what extent did Congress en envision that the statute would apply retroactively. I think we all know that Congress in the immigration space has often retroactively applied laws. Fortunately, it appears here that that will not be the case. And um, there are some uh, uh, wonderful advantages that have come up in terms of uh, adjustments of status uh, that can be uh, applied for now with respect to pending petitions. 
Um, it uh, is a, a very attractive opportunity. Uh, the, the other uh, nice thing about adjustment of status is that finally, uh, a forgiveness clause known as INA Section 245K has uh, been expanded to include the EB-5 category so that if someone makes a lawful entry uh, and uh, uh, wishes to apply for adjustment of status, he or she may, even though there may have been up to 180 days of a violation of status. Uh, 245K purges or purifies against all prior failures to maintain status. But if one makes a lawful admission and does not fall out of status or engage in unauthorized employment, they can uh, uh, benefit, benefit from this provision and adjust status nevertheless. Uh, the one thing that's really interesting is, first of all, petitions that are pending are going to be adjudicated under the old rules. And uh, yet, um, what happens when there needs to be an amendment to a business plan? Uh, the, the, uh, the statute provides that amendments to business plans uh, that were previously approved, so presumably exemplar approvals, uh, will be valid except in certain circumstances, such as where there has been a material change that affects eligibility. I would say that that uh, uh, will be the where where the controversy will arise as to what is a material change, which is an issue that has long plagued the EB-5 area because the agency has not been very clear about those matters. Uh, those are some of the highlights of what, what to foresee. Wonderful, Angelo. That was a <clears throat> quite a tour through that road mine. I mean, to the mine roads, <laughs> road, road, road which is mine rather, forgive my tongue of slip. But uh, you mentioned that there are exemplars now um, and there will be new, new kinds of exemplars going forward. Let me turn to David for that. Uh, can you talk to us about these new project ap applications that the statute envisions? Certainly. Firstly, thank you, Sam and the ILW team for inviting me. I'm honored, in fact, flattered to be on a panel with both Laura and uh, and Angelo, uh, it's really special to be with him and thank them as well. Special thanks to Laura and her teams of people who managed to get this through the door and it was very instrumental in bringing about all that we are seeing as approved today. So thank you, Laura. Um, as far as the uh, exemplars are concerned, they haven't called it an exemplar, they've called it an application. And what is required by the law is that you file an application <clears throat> showing what your project is all about before you may file an I-526 in any one case. However, the benefit is that you don't have to wait for an approval of that application. The additional benefit is once approved, the documents attached to that application, similar to the old exemplar rules, will be allowed to be used and referred to in your I-526 filings, and that will save a tremendous number of uh, pages and copies being sent and posted and so on. So there's quite a bit of advantage in that. Um, we still have to wait for things like uh, uh, targeted employment areas to be approved in the actual adjudication of the I-526, but I personally am not seeing a major issue there. Thank you, sir. Wonderful. So <clears throat> it looks for <clears throat> the first time in a long time, the USCIS is uh, sparing some thought for the forests of trees that are being cut down to for all the paperwork that they want. And hopefully this time they uh, did something right. That's great. I want to remind everybody, you can ask questions in the Q&A function at the bottom. You can also do it through chat if that's what you prefer. And I'm going to try to select the ones which are of general interest and pose them to the panel once we are done with the questions. So please go ahead and enter your questions at any time because I'm going to give priority to the questions that come in early. So it's first come, first serve. So please don't hesitate to put your questions in. Let's turn back uh, to Laura. Of course, uh, this was something that, as David remarked, uh, was something that uh, was a subject of a lot of extended uh, negotiation with Congress. And what was uh, it that we negotiated uh, for? Uh, Laura, can you walk us through that? So, so over the years, there have been many different um, congressmen and senators that have worked together on EB-5 legislation. And um, this time that there was nothing different. Um, we, we started really last summer, it always seems to be while I'm on vacation, um, where we are working on a draft piece of legislation that was actually um, ultimately penned by Chairman Nadler, who is the chairman of the House, the House Judiciary Committee, um, working on um, legislation that would change the integrity measures 
It would increase the, the numbers in the program. It would change the investment levels. It would do things to protect investors from aging out. It would protect investors from fraud and um, you know, have some important things, especially the extension of the program and the adjustment um, of the investment levels. So we worked on that. And then we worked um, a kind of across the aisle with um, Senators Grassley, Leahy, Senator Schumer, and others on trying to come up with legislation that all industry could get around. And I think it was Sunday night for the 11th of, of March that we finally came to something that um, the coalition and everybody could agree with. And honestly, in the end, it was the legislators making the final decision. Unfortunately, we were not able to keep the backlog reduction um, provisions in. We're eliminating the derivatives or recapturing visas or doing something that would really help with some of the severe backlogs. But as I said earlier, we're looking forward to, um, you know, working with um, both the agency and Congress on some backlog reduction methods. Um, but in the end, it really was um, Senator Schumer um, coming to an agreement with Senator Leahy and Grassley and others um, on getting a longer term extension of this program, getting it off life support, really resuscitating it from death and getting it moving. I do want to mention there's one key issue that's I think absolutely essential that the agency needs to address right away. And those are some four statements that have been flying around from Senators Cornyn and Senator, uh, Senator Grassley about whether regional centers that are already designated would need to go through the redesignation process. Our read of that legislation is that, no, we don't need to do that. That I think is the view of Senator Schumer and um, Congressman Chairman Nadler, but Senator Grassley does seem to believe that regional centers that are already designated would need to go through their new, would have to go through redesignation and not just certification with the new integrity measures. So we're trying to get clarity on that. We do not believe that that is the, um, the read. That is what um, we're trying to get the agency to focus on. And we have a laundry list of things that we would like the agency to deal with in, um, in uh, guidance, and then ultimately some issues that have to be dealt with in notice and comment rulemaking. <clears throat> Wonderful, uh, absolutely, Rora. I, I mean, we uh, the statute just puts in the broad framework that Congress wishes to set for policy for the United States, and then of course the agency must step in in the interstices and come out with um, uh, various guidance, uh, including policy guidance, and where necessary under the Administrative Procedure Act, come for, forward with rulemaking. So let's turn to that. And let's turn to Angela Paparelli. What can we expect in terms of rules and policymaking, sir? Well, uh, this is uh, not really a, a view into the crystal ball that uh, is unique to my own. We have all seen how long it takes for regulations to uh, be proposed, uh, to uh, pass through the OMB review process, have all of the other departments of, in, of government uh, chime in. So I think what we're going to see is a repeat of the previous pattern where from time to time, there will be proposed amendments to the USCIS policy manual. There will be web announcements of implementation of changes that seem to uh, fall. Both of these fall under the concept of sub-regulatory guidance. Um, uh, in Administrative Procedure Act terms. And uh, I, I hope the agency will do as it did with the, uh, uh, the uh, very long initial memorandum of guidance. It will offer the opportunity for public input. Um, on that score, however, it, it should be uh, noted that public input is going to be just that, public. Um, there is a provision known as transparency, uh, section 107 of, of the act, uh, which bars preferential treatment would penalize governmental officials who um, are seen to be giving preferential treatment to any particular stakeholder, will require recording of uh, all documentation and uh, transcription of minutes of conversations. Uh, and, and I think this is obviously in, in light of what happened to now Secretary of Homeland Security Mayorkas when he was the director of USCIS and uh, was um, criticized for perceiving uh, to be giving 
uh, uh, preferential treatment. I think that was an unfair allegation. I don't think it was warranted. Uh, he was trying to get his arms around, as a good lawyer, uh, what the EB-5 program requires. Uh, but that that's over. So uh, we will have to be dealing with uh, a public stakeholder engagements. Uh, maybe there will be a role for the USCIS ombudsman. Uh, not clear yet. I think that it's interesting that uh, Section 102C of the Act uh, provides for enhanced pay scale for individuals designated by the Secretary of Homeland Security as critical, technical, and professional positions needed to administer the EB-5 program. Uh, that, I, I, I think, is something that had happened before. There was an ende endeavor to hire specialists in uh, economics in uh, in corporate law, in securities law. Um, and it often seemed to raise questions about what was the authority of these particular individuals to act as adjudicators. I think that issue is still there. And we need to know how will the agency reach an adjudicative decision if it, there's sort of a committee of decision makers comprised of these several stakeholders or several participants who are now going to be paid market rates, presumably. So it, lots to, to anticipate. Uh, it's an exciting time. I think we'll all be involved in the, in the give and take and the jousting with the agency over what ought to happen. And that's just the, the USCIS, of course, the same thing is gonna happen with the State Department. Right, right. And the State Department is sometimes a bit of a black box and uh, maybe this transparency, let's hope and pray that some of that sunlight reaches into the State Department. <laughs> it doesn't appear that transparency was directed to the State Department, though. So they, I was they, expressing they, a hope and a prayer. To, I see. They're going to remain <laughs> shrouded in mystery. And already, uh -huh. Ayla, by the way, has sent uh, a, a very interesting letter to the State Department uh, challenging the interpretation has been published in the Visa Bulletin as to uh, whether uh, uh, there can be EB-5 uh, immigrant visa interviews uh, scheduled. So uh, much to await and to argue about. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. Let's turn to David. Um, lots of changes in the new statutes for what matters most to most of the immigration members of the bar, I mean, members of the bar who for specialize in immigration um, you know, they, they often are not on the project side, but are on the investor side and produce source of funds. And can you tell us about uh, what the source, what, what are the source of funds provisions in the new act? Sure. Just a comment on what Angela said a moment ago about Secretary Mayorkas. I happen to be very involved in that specific case. And I, from personal experience, can tell you that this man was so straight arrowed and so separate from everyone else that this was very much a, a political play, which... Uh, Unfortunately, in my opinion, anyway, overcame. So let's get on to source of funds. Uh, not a whole lot different, but there are some differences. So let's start off with um, gifted and loaned investment funds. These are now permitted, however, specifically relating to families, uh, to, to gifts. If the gift or is not a bank, you have to prove the lawful source of funds. The gift itself must be a bona fide gift, it can't be done to avoid or manipulate the system in a way to basically uh, launder monies. And uh, the proceeds, as before, may not come from any illegal source. So that basically is your source of funds. In addition, you have to put up seven years of tax returns. Now, five years is already very burdensome. If you think about your own personal tax returns, I don't know if you'll be able to find one from two years ago, but some of us are a little more organized than others. I'm not in that category. So seven years is a tremendous amount of research, particularly for people from countries that do not maintain Western level of records and information. So that's going to be a challenge we'll have to deal with and probably be asking more for waivers than for actual compliance. Thank you, sir. Wow. <clears throat> if I could add just a tiny footnote, it's also interesting that the source of funds uh, to pay uh, finders and, uh, and others who are incentivized to make the project happen have to also be proven as lawful. Right, right. So <clears throat> uh, that's a good point. And again, they try to throw in legal fees as well. I don't know if that's quite made it. Nora, is it in? Legal fees need to be proved as well? I don't think so. Not the legal fees. Great. And of course, the agents, migration agents, have to have full disclosure of these commissions, and that's going to put a, 
a, a great dampener on their business because unfortunately part of their business was not to disclose particularly to their own investors thank you sir sure sure no no I absolutely call it a damper i would call it transparency and let the sunlight <laughs> shine well, we'll see in the market if the market uh, uh, treats this as a dampener or perhaps an accelerant. We'll find out uh, or neither, you know, but let's learn a little bit from the wisdom of the crowds here. We're going to run a short poll. I'm going to request members of the audience and we have 90 people, nine zero, I think, attending right now. Um, can we launch a poll? Everyone, please, technology. And it's only three questions. It's multiple choice. Just choose the right on your screen right now. And we're going to see the results together. None of the panelists can vote. None of us can vote. I can't vote, but we'll see the results together in about a minute from now or so. If I can request everyone who to just put in, register your thoughts. The idea is to understand. And by the way, we're going to share all of this information by email to everybody later so that you can get an idea of where did you stand with respect to everybody else. And it helps all of us benchmark. What's the size of the market? What are we talking about? Is it is it very small, under half a billion a year in new investment, or is it Titanic, over five billion a year uh, in new investment, or something in the middle? We're giving you multiple choices, and please register your thoughts. Um, it's it's a guess. The question is where the money going to come from. That's the second question. Is it coming? And we've given you the top two choices. What are the top two choices? And we even have uh, the seventh one is none of the above. So if you don't agree with the top two choices, you can go for none of the above if that's what you want. And the top two choices are in sequence. Is it China first and then USA? USA first and then China? India and USA? USA and India? So we get a number of different choices there. And we try to mix it all up. And please register your thoughts there. Uh, and then the final question is, <coughs> excuse me, something that all of our speakers refer to in terms of, um, of uh, clarity in terms of when are we going to really know what this statute means? When are we going to have <clears throat> uncontradictory policy guidance and lawful regulations uh, duly adopted by the agency? Is it going to happen rapidly, like in 60 days? Is it going to take God awful long time, as in three years or something in the middle? So if you will please register your thoughts. A lot of people have already done so. About half the audience has done so. And uh, <laughs> I'm going to give people a few more seconds to complete if they need that. I can see many people are every second or so shows one or two or three people or four people finishing it. Uh, we're going to going, going, gone now. I'm going to give everyone just five more seconds. And if you need those three more seconds to register your opinion, please do so. And I think we are going to call it a day now. Technology, can we stop the poll and take a look at the results? All right, everyone should have the results on your screen. I'm going to try to summarize that uh, for, the, for the record. Um, in terms of the size of the market, uh, uh, there seems to be a consensus. It's going to be between 500 million to 2 billion. So not too tiny, not too huge. It's somewhere in the middle. So pretty much uh, the market that we've seen, which is remarkable, given that we are increasing the prices by 60% or more. So that's not a, 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 a small accomplishment if, in fact, it comes to pass. Um, in terms of where will the top two markets be, we are all over the map. Everyone seems to like something in each of the combinations that was that was presented. So we'll have to find out really where the money comes from. Um, and then in terms of when will we have clarity, a lot of people seem to think six months to a year. Um, uh, that seems to be the consensus opinion in the middle. But there's, there's a fair number of people on either side of that. Um, and uh, so that's what we have. And we will send this to everyone uh, by email. Now, I do want to address one member of the audience has raised her or his hand. Uh, we, we're not taking questions uh, uh, by audio. It'd just be overwhelming. Uh, we have about a dozen questions pending uh, in the Q&A and the chat box. So please go ahead and put your question in there. Um, and please don't raise your hand. Go ahead and put your questions in. Several people raise their hands. Please don't do, the, do so. Just go ahead and register your questions on, on the bottom uh, where it says Q&A or chat, whichever you prefer. And I'll try to bring them in uh, to, the, uh, to the attention of our distinguished panelists as soon as we're done with one final round uh, of questions from me. <clears throat> so let me turn to, to Laura. So yes, you know, we, we asked for something from Congress over these last five years as an industry. Some people asked for one thing, uh, some others asked for another. Uh, and then there was a negotiations so and negotiations naturally in our system of government um, involved everybody. Everybody had an opportunity to make their voice heard. Uh, some from the rural side, some from the urban side, some from in between. Um, and uh, then those negotiations once were completed, we, we got something. What did we get? Yeah, you know, I thought there's there's a rule of thumb in um, when you're working on legislation that don't let the perfect become the enemy of the good. And in the end, we got the program resuscitated and it is operational. And it had the buy-in from both rural, urban distressed and uh, regular um, um, 
um, interests, stakeholders. So I think what, what we got was a five-year extension that's reattached to the appropriations process, which is very important. If you recall, we were um, detached from that process and that's what allowed the program to lapse in June of um, 2021. So we got new investment levels that were much more reasonable. As I said, they were much more reasonable than the November 2019 regulatory um, um, investment levels that were struck down. Um, and we got a reasonable differential. We ended up um, not getting the backlog reduction, which we thought was very important, um, but we will have other efforts um, to do that. And as I said, this program was reattached to the appropriation cycle and unfortunately, or fortunately for us, a lot of legislation is done on an appropriation cycle. Things get put on these appropriations bills at the end of the fifth fiscal year. So we can look for some technical corrections if we need to do that. We can look for some other immigration uh, fixes if we need to do that. And we can look at some uh, administrative fixes. So we got, um, I think, a fair, Bill, we got a revised definition of targeted employment area. It includes something that for urban distressed areas that's very similar to what we had in the November 2019 regulations. We kept the definition of rural the same. And um, we ended up with a very narrow definition of infrastructure projects, which are uh, basically government uh, driven infrastructure projects and some set asides. Those set-asides have been something that Senator Grassley has been very, very anxious to have. Visa set-asides, not for the regional center program, which is something that we had had before, but set-asides for these um, targeted areas, for the urban distressed, for the rural areas, and now infrastructure projects. And those set-asides are set-asides that I think are reasonable given the, um, given the number of visas that are available and they do carry over for um, a year so it's it's one to two years and then they go back into the general pot so i think we got something that everybody can live with is it perfect no does it need changes yes are we going to be able to make some changes regulatorily and through some of this um, um, guidance from the agency i do think so all right Thank you. That's uh, that's quite a tour de raison. <clears throat> Let's turn to Angelo, and I'm going to take a potpourri of questions. I'm going to kind of roll them into one quick question. How will USCIS conduct I-829 adjudications, possible interview waivers, site visits, and where does FDNS come in in all of this? Well, the good news is we don't have to figure this out for a couple of years um, because uh, the, the site visit program in particular has been delayed. And uh, uh, the interesting thing about uh, uh, this issue, site visits um, have been uh, the bane of many a petitioner uh, and some beneficiaries who were surprised by visits to home and uh, office. Uh, fortunately, site visit visits will at least have a 24 hour advance notice in most instances. Um, where does FDNS fit? Well, I have long uh, maintained, and I think uh, with legitimacy, if one looks to the Homeland Security Act, uh, that FDNS is an un unlawfully uh, constituted body because the Homeland Security Act says that uh, only ICE and CBP shall conduct intelligence gathering and investigations and that USCIS should be limited to adjudications. I think site visits are, are a euphemism for unlawful investigations. Now, fortunately, uh, I can still maintain that view because the only place where FDNS is mentioned is in the determination of whether there should be possible interview waivers. And so perhaps uh, FDNS has a law enforcement uh, basis to say, waive this interview, don't waive that interview. But it does not say that FDNS shall conduct site visits in this statute. And I hope we can eventually get a court to throw out um, the excess uh, overreach of, of uh, jurisdiction that USCIS has endeavored over many years. Uh, it may come in filing fee lit litigation as it almost did re previously. But as for interview waivers, um, that's anyone's guess. I mean, uh, 
if if there is obviously a very clear and compelling proof that the investment uh, amounts were sustained and uh, the jobs were created, um, what's the purpose of an interview waiver? Well, if it's if if there's been a security clearance and there's nothing untoward that has appeared, uh, and with 245K blessing any failures to comply with status, it would seem that interview waivers should be robust and, and frequent. But, uh, and, and uh, oftentimes we have seen that in the employment-based categories where if a petitioner, uh, excuse me, if an employee uh, on a work visa is uh, sponsored for a green card by the same employer in the same job, they typically will waive the interview. So I hope USCIS will uh, marshal or husband its resources in a way to not waste the time of, the, of uh, uh, field office adjudicators to figure out the EB-5 uh, statute in, in a matter of minutes before the interview as the, as the file is put on their desk. So I hope interview waivers will be robust. No, thank you, Angelo. And if I may add you... one other thing, and that is that although site visits will be postponed, um, the the amount of change that will be required of regional centers and project developers in terms of minimum capital requirements for fund administration, for uh, compliance with the filing fee amounts, which are rather large, uh, for all of the record keeping and law compliance elements. Um, I would suggest regional centers had better get their act in order very, very quickly uh, so that they will be in a position to demonstrate full compliance because USCIS doesn't have to wait for a site visit to say this doesn't make sense because it's incomplete. It, 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 it omits material facts there. And, and the record keeping that must be maintained and the documentation that must be filed uh, with, with the application, as David referred to it, rather than an exemplar, is voluminous. That, that, is a, that runs contrary to your goal of, of uh, saving trees, because there will still be a lot of documentation to be collected. <clears throat> No, no, if absolutely. I could just just add real quickly, I, I agree. I think, you know, I, I would just go go as far as to say the the regional centers that are doing their own projects and are operating the new commercial enterprises and the job creating entities are going to have a lot of explaining to do to the agency. Um, there was a clear um, direction from Congress that that this is not a preferred <laughs> method, and there there will be fund administration, there will be um, accountability, and um, I agree. Um, hopefully, a lot of this can be done electronically, but there's going to be a lot of reporting, and those, that reporting doesn't just go to the agency; it goes to the SEC, and it, a lot of it's going to go to the indiv individual investors. So, Laura, if I understood your your comment. Uh, uh, the phenomenon will more likely move to the rent-a-center uh, approach? I would think that that's probably where it's going to go. Um, so that, you know, there is some arm's length in these, in these transactions and we don't have regional centers running their own projects down to, through the NCE and the JC. Does that mean that lawyers can't be promoters and regional centers and uh, representatives of the investor in the same case? I think that there were problems with that beforehand and there's gonna be even more so now. Yeah. As a general thumb rule, you want everyone <clears throat> to have zealous representation. It's hard to do that if you're on two sides of the same transaction, but I did want to editorialize on one matter that Angela brought up, which is that you know no one here in the immigration community is against law enforcement. Uh, that's, that's a completely wrong attitude that some folks who are on the other side, on the agency side seem to think so. But on the other hand, there are clear uh, you know, there have to be a clear legal basis for law enforcement. And Angelo points out that as far as the statutory authority is concerned, such law enforcement within the Department of Homeland Security, as far as immigration is concerned, is within the hands of ICE and CBP. So no one's arguing that FDNSS functions are, are inappropriate, but what we are saying is they are uh, improperly placed. They should be placed within the right agency. And uh, <clears throat> there exists a legal basis to, to challenge this unlawful behavior because uh, they are funded by fees. Those fees were for benefits and um, and uh, they're not being used for benefits. They're being used for law enforcement. And that is, that, that's, that is uh, uh, a, a, you know, arguably a breaking of the law. Uh, so, uh, you know, the UCIS folks should, should please understand they're a benefits agency, that's their job. And they shouldn't suddenly start coming to work with a, a gun on their holster and, a, and an attitude to match. So having said that editorial, let me now turn one for one last time to um, 
uh, to David Herson and ask him about, uh, there's a, a discussion about how do you meet with the job requirements in terms of employee count? There's a difference now than what it used to be. Could you shed some light on that, sir? Certainly. Well, in 1990, when the first uh, EB-5 employment creation law was passed, you had to have 10 employees, full-time, legal, on payroll, um, and that was the rule. Uh, two years later, we got the regional center program. We were then allowed to take all or some of those employees and have them shown to be created by reason of economic formulae and uh, analyses showing that the impact of that investment on the location created a certain number of jobs. Well, that hasn't been totally changed, but there is some change. Firstly, the 10 employees that we now have under regional center, they use the word 90% may be through economic formulae. However, that simply means one in 10 has to be on payroll. So for every investor who's going to ask for an EB-5 uh, green card, you will have to have at least one worker on payroll. I've been asked questions, will that be on the NCE's payroll or the job creating entity's payroll? And I think it has to be at the job creating entity's payroll, but uh, this is a something for ongoing discussion. David, I, I was curious if you had any thought on whether this is going to change the nature of the investments that real estate has been historically um, the, the one that has used, been used in the uh, regional center program. Um, and uh, um, ordinarily, there is a separate management company that manages the buildings. And so I'm wondering how they're going to be restructured in a way to meet that 10% uh, direct employment requirement. Do you have any thoughts about whether real estate is going to uh, be uh, less prominent as an EB-5 vehicle, or will there be other industries? A good, a good point, Angela. I think that uh, it'll maintain its high level. There'll be some adjustment in those management contracts. They'll be brought into compliance with the hiring requirements, and I think it can be worked around. I've certainly worked it with other historic hotel or uh, entertainment um, uh, hospitality type uh, projects. And so it, it should, in my mind, it shouldn't impact the industry uh, to any material extent. It will require some adjustment. But moving on, we have uh, uh, the 90% requirement are on payroll. Uh, and then we've got the construction jobs. If you have construction that's going to last less than two years, you may now only take 75% of the jobs that the economists can project for that. You'll still also have to have one on payroll. And so that changes it. If you go over the two years, the 100% of the amount calculated can be used. Once again, still having one on payroll. But then there's another area of employment, which I'm gonna bring into what we'll call pooled investments. Well, when I first read the rules, I thought, oh, well, there go the pooled investments for direct hire out the window. And when I looked at it a little more closely, I saw that not really so. What's really happened there is that they just wanted pooled investments for direct hire to fall under the same control and rules of the regional centers. And that's why I believe, and Laura can throw further light on this, it was brought in to the um, regional center umbrella. So that leaves us with our pooled investments. Uh, there you had up to 100% direct hire, so your 90%, one, one per 10, will not feature, but you'll still have to have all the other compliance issues there. On the other side, you can't have more than one person in a direct hire investment, which I found a little difficult to accept, because what about the two brothers who go into business together? Uh, that type of scenario, and they both want to get their EB-5s. Uh, a lot of creativity is coming down the pike, and I think I'm on a panel on that in a few weeks' time. Uh, some people are saying create separate entities with joint venture and each has its own 10 employees. So I'm sure uh, wiser lawyers than me will find a solution, and then we'll all follow and get things done on a pro in proper order. So that's uh, that's it on employment, Sam. I don't know if there's anything else, uh, Laura. Or... No, no, no. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate yeah, it. Well, Laura, just, Laura, just, Laura, just, Laura, just, just real quick on the EB-5. Uh, oh. Let Laura speak, Angelo, then we'll come to you. Go ahead, Laura. Just real quick on the, the pool direct. I think that's exactly right, David, that they're trying to get um, all the compliance issues uh, for the regional centers to apply to pooled investments as well. This is a bit of a gray area, and I think the agency is really going to have to, to um, you know, 
focus on this because pooled direct is different than a regional center. And so they're going to have to be guidelines, even though, even though the intent from my understanding is that uh, pooled direct has to abide by some of the regional center requirements. It's gonna be interesting to see how the agency puts out a notice of um, proposed rulemaking on this. Right. Well, Go ahead, Angela. I, I would like to ask you about the fund administration provision if it, in a pool direct uh, context. Um, if you take the prototypical investor that wants to start his own business or her own business and hire 10 employees, um, does, the, uh, does that investor now have to use the fund administrator? The last panel that we had on ILW seemed to say yes. And it's kind of awkward to have to bring in a fund administrator when you're running your own business. So it's really interesting. I, I think the fund administration um, provisions um, kind of look more onerous than they probably will end up being because you have waivers. You have a potential waiver and then a mandatory waiver. So I think what you'll see is people coming in with um, accounting firms and doing audits, annual audits at the end of the year. I think that seems to be the better way to do it. I think the agency is going to have some issues on fund administration putting out, you know, trying to parse the statute's language because some of the fund administration appears not to even, if you do choose to do use a fund administrator, not to even include a bank. So I think, you know, there's going to be some, some issues on fund administration, but I think in most scenarios, it appears, you know, at least the regional centers I've talked to, they're probably going to choose, and I would imagine the pooled investment um, EB-5 investment vehicles, the um, pool direct, are going to choose to do the annual audit, which is a required waiver, not it would so the agency shall waive. So if you choose that, you can opt out of the fund administrator. But I'm anxious to see how the <coughs> is going to write up the proposed rules on that. Yeah, okay. If I might, I wanted to just add a footnote to David's comment about jobs. And I saw a, a, a comment from a respected colleague um, that there is the, still the issue of tenant occupancy. And it, it appears that the, that has been resolved to, to say that uh, new jobs uh, that can be counted, but relocated jobs uh, for people who move from an, one affiliated um, arm of a large organization to the new location cannot. Right, <clears throat> and we'll have to see how, what is the evidentiary method by which UCIS will examine those two different kinds of, uh, of job positions. But before we, um, uh, now we, we want to turn to questions, obviously, but we're going to have a, and we've got 15 or 17 or some questions here, and I'm going to turn to them shortly. Uh, it turns out six or seven of them are on the same topic, so it will be pretty quick to handle. You have your last opportunity now, folks in the audience, to put your questions in, uh, but I'm going to have a short 20-second commercial break Right now, the last one of the of, of the seminar. Uh, Shrikant, please take it away. Thanks, Sam. Uh, RW has EB-5 events coming up where you can market to potential EB-5 investors both in the USA and Asia. In the USA, we're doing events in Austin on April 22nd, Dallas on April 24th, and San Jose on May 7th. In addition, we have Asia events coming up in Mumbai on May 19th and Kuwait on May 22nd. To exhibit and speak at these events, you can reach us at webmaster at ilw.com. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. So let's turn to questions. And there is one question or, or a set of questions, about six or seven, which have the same general theme. So rather than try to summarize it and leave out important information, I'm just going to rattle through those six or seven rapidly. They're quite short. Um, and if, if the panel will just bear with me for a minute or so, I'm going to quickly read through those six or seven, and then you can address it in any order or sequence or whatever uh, a conceptual connection you may or may not see. So the questions are, quote, one, when will NVC open for processing current investors, unquote. Uh, let's go to the second one. Um, uh, can we file adjustment of status applications when there is a pending I-526? Query, now, query or after the 60 day period query, can we do this now or do we need to wait until USCIS makes an announcement? Close quote. Third one, is the option for concurrent filing of I-526 and I-485 available for existing investors? Um, and then another one, when will the processing of pending petitions start? Um, and uh, let me see if there is, um, when can existing investors from the US file for adjustment of status? 
Um, and uh, for pending I-526 petitions based on RC projects, when should the investors file their I-485 if they're legally in the US? I think you get the gist. A lot of questions around the same basic theme. May I request the panel to address it if and as appropriate? <clears throat> I think concurrent filing. Oh, I'll just start real quick on concurrent filing. I think that was a big win. That was something that we've been really working for um, for a while. I mean, you can concurrently file other employment-based petitions um, with adjustment of status um, petitions. So I think that's one area where um, we have a huge win and we may even be able to make it larger. Um, USCIS and Homeland Security and the Department of State put out dates of filing as opposed to priority dates. Maybe we can get dates of filing um, earlier than, um, than we've seen before in order to take advantage of concurrent filing. I think just uh, given the effective dates in the, the program and Homeland Security's um, inability to put any real guidance out. They say on the website that they're working on things that I, I probably the earliest you could um, do anything is probably May 14th, which would be at the, the 60 day mark unless Homeland Security puts something else out. But that's just my quick take. I think it's a big win. It's something we really were pushing for. Now we, we're seeing two issues from a practical point of view. We've had an inundation of people requesting to do the adjustment of status I-485s. The first is um, it's going to take a long time to get your work authorization and your travel document. And that presents a problem for some people who may run out of their existing visas. The second is the issue of somebody who's not in the US wanting to come in to take advantage of this program. And there you have issues of visa fraud, misrepresentation on entry and so on with very, very serious consequences. So. Basically, there's a 60 day rule, some people still call it a 90 day rule, that you may not do anything towards your permanent residence uh, for that period of time before, uh, after uh, admission into the US. Uh, that argument bounces around whether you're on different kinds of visas, like L's and H's might be okay, whereas student visas or visitor visas probably are not. And so there's a lot of practical issue that's floating around this a lot of questions coming into me all of the time and i'll be interested in the panel's thoughts on what do you do with people out of the country well i i'd like to address that uh, uh, and and i think the best way to understand this is that there are two kinds of dual intent um uh and uh, uh some lawyers call h's and l's and maybe o1 visas dual intent visas um, by statute, uh, I call them no intent visas, intent irrelevant visas, whereas all of the visa categories, uh, the visitor, uh, the J-1, the student, uh, F-1, um, are eligible for dual intent, uh, including the TN and, and the E-3, are eligible for dual intent by judicial declaration. Uh, not only within the courts, but also in the Board of Immigration Appeals in matter of Hosseinpur, and that someone can, as long as they maintain the unrelinquished permanent residence abroad to which they intend to return, if the law requires them to do so, can qualify and show legitimate dual intent. Um, they can have two desires, a short-term desire and a long-term desire to adjust status. Uh, the, the challenge, I think, is to not assume that the, uh, the former uh, uh, 30, 60, 90 day provision of the Foreign Affairs Manual has any remaining vi vitality. It never was a formally adopted by USCIS. And in fact, the State Department has retreated from it. So there's going to be a facts and circumstances assessment in every single case. And you are right, David, the stakes are high because there could be easily an allegation of preconceived intent, which is unlawful, uh, contrasted with dual intent. And I doubt that many field office adjudicators at, at interviews are going to know this stuff. So having solid representation, making sure that the facts can be mustered in a way that will demonstrate convincingly legitimate judicial dual intent is important. I think that the quality of the examiners, unfortunately, in this highly sophisticated area is wanting, and we will have a lot of difficulty proving um, borderline type cases. So my conservative advice is don't do it. 
rather wait out your time, which is not what clients want to hear. I, no, I hear you. That's the case. Let me just add that um, uh, if someone were to enter lawfully and uh, uh, they uh, defer the application for adjustment of status for some months, assume that they have a six month entry on a visitor visa, um, the, uh, the, you talked about uh, the need to travel, the need for employment authorization. If, if those are not significant uh, with the 245K changes, I would say postponing the submission of the application uh, till the, the ending of uh, the uh, period of admission might be a prudent course. But again, it's going to be individualized and case by case. <clears throat> Just real quickly on that, Angelo and, and David, if you do um, stay in the US for a certain period of time and then do an adjustment of status under the new regulations that have just been proposed by Homeland Security yesterday, I guess they were actually came out officially today, we may actually be able to expedite the work, work authorization. Petition. Right, right. So not, not, not the travel petition, but the work authorization after we get through the 60 day um, effective date period, I think it's a 45 day wait. So we may be able to streamline the work authorization provision. So mm -hmm. I think there is a way to do it. It is dangerous to just, you know, come in and think that you're going to file File, file an adjustment of status. I think you really need to, to talk it through ahead of time and then make sure that you get the right guidance when you get here. Well, thank you for that illuminating discussion. I appreciate it. Let's turn to the <clears throat> another question. Um, <clears throat> and I'm going to quote here, and, and I think this is important because apparently, uh, <clears throat> and I'm going to presume that this quote is accurate uh, from Charles Oppenheim of the State Department. Uh, apparently, he was asked the question, um, <clears throat> do the reserved visa categories create even longer delays for mainland China with the fact that 3,200 visas are being pulled from the general category? And here was a response and would the panel have any, any, any comments on the response? I'm quoting, quote, I think there is, this is Charlie Oppenheim again, quote, I think there is the potential for that. Although it's unknown how many of the Chinese applicants that are in line may be able to benefit by this new set aside, unquote. Any, any thoughts at all? Well, this issue has come up a fair amount um, over the, the past few years as we've been talking about set-asides, set-asides that last for a year, set-asides that last at one point, I think it was in 2017, in perpetuity, so that they keep, either you lose them at the end of the year or they keep rolling into the same set-aside category. I think it's gonna be incumbent upon all of us in the industry to weigh in with the State Department on how they interpret this. It was our um, understanding and our belief as we were negotiating the legislation that these set-asides would take effect on a prospective basis. They would not be retroactive. Now, how that's actually implemented is, is something that's you know, getting down into the weeds, but that was the, the understanding of the industry at the time. So we'll see how that how it gets interpreted. Uh, Mr. Oppenheim is brilliant at his work, but I believe he's retired. So was that statement made before or after retirement? No, it was. <clears throat> I believe it is after retirement. I believe this was uh, this was very recent, as in last week. Thank you for clarifying that, David. No, this is not an official statement by an official of the Department of State. Thank you, David. He's a knowledgeable person. Let's put it that way. Knowledgeable person, right? <clears throat> Okay, <clears throat> uh, another question also uh, quoting Charles Oppenheim and again asking for comments from the panel. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm gonna read the question regarding the quote, unused visas unquote roll over provision in the new law. Please comment on this additional statement from Charles Oppenheim in last week's webinar, quote, in one way of looking at this, the INA guidelines are clearly state how unused numbers within a preference categories annual limit should be made available to other preferences. For example, section 203B1 indicates already that any unused employment fourth or fifth preference number should be added to the EB1 annual limit. Also section 201C says that any unused numbers from the previous year's worldwide employment limit fall across and are to be used in the determination of the next year's family sponsored annual limit. I think there will likely be a need for technical corrections, unquote emphasis added, is my, my editorial part. Any, any, any thoughts on that technical corrections part? That is what I believe the questioner is asking. I, I think there are opportunities for technical corrections. Um, I think that the, um, as I said, 
this legislation has been reattached to the appropriations cycle, so there will be opportunities to, to do technical corrections. I think if the agency, and this is just my opinion based on what I understand Congress's intent was in this, if the agency interprets it the way that we believe Congress intended to do it, we wouldn't need a technical correction. Yeah, I'd like to comment. Uh, technical corrections sometimes are, um, are are characterized as minor in nature, uh, correcting language, putting in a semicolon. Uh, but we've seen in the immigration space, I, I know in the H-1B uh, category, we, we had uh, an original H-1B provision that said the uh, employer had to hot pay American workers in the same occupational classification, the same um, actual wage uh, as uh, um, all of the H-1B workers. In other words, a forced salary increase. That was changed into technical correction, which I thought was a very substantive change. And industry should know that there is the possibility that significant substantive changes can arise under the guise of a technical amendment. Well, absolutely true. I mean, 245I's genesis was in the Miscellaneous Technical Corrections Act of, I think, 1994, if my memory serves me correct. So, you know, technical corrections under immigration have a way of, uh, of becoming very substantive. And, and that perhaps is not stretching the meaning of the word technical corrections. They may be technical within the framework of the act. Doesn't mean they're technical when it's applied to the real world and may apply to millions of people. So uh, well, that's for good clarification, thank you. We do have many, many unanswered questions and I'm sure uh, folks in the audience that we, if we had more time, we could go into that, but we have uh, you know, stressed the courtesy of our panel for long enough. We promised them that it would not reach the hour and we are at 56 minutes past the hour and closing it on 57. So I do have to thank our panelists for their kindness and sharing their knowledge and experience uh, and expertise with our uh, audience. So we'll have this up on YouTube for those who may have missed a minute or two here or there uh, so that you can catch up on everything. And with that, I want to thank everyone for listening and goodbye from ILW.com. Thank you, everyone. Thank you,